It was in the winter of 1891 when I was physical instructor at Springfield College in Massachusetts. We had a real New England blizzard. For days, the students couldn't go outdoors, so they began roughhousing in the halls. We tried everything to keep them quiet. We tried playing a modified form of football in the gymnasium, but they got bored with that. Something had to be done. One day, I had an idea. I called the boys to the gym, divided them up into teams of nine, and gave them an old soccer ball. I showed them two peach baskets I'd nailed up at each end of the gym, and I told them the idea was to throw the ball into the opposing team's peach basket. I blew a whistle, and the first game of basketball began. Include white, black, Hispanic, Asian, everybody into this beautiful game. I often say it's a child's game, but I also say when it's uh, when it's done properly, it becomes an art form. The story should be told is something that's very exciting to me. People were segregated. Jewish people were playing Jewish people. Blacks playing black. It's staggering, to be honest. It, it's just something that Dr. Nate Smith could never comprehend. Uh, what was going to happen in the next 50 to 100 years. It's an amazing story to hear of this Canadian man who invented this incredible sport for the world. I just remember him as a kind gentleman, and just he's the one who started in the game that I left. He was a builder of character. He was a professor back at the, at the it school. It is a natural, the game of basketball, to cross gender boundaries. Master planner, strategist. Sports has always been the place that transcends color, occupation, political philosophies. So for sure, so it definitely surprised me that the guy that created basketball was that type of guy. 1933, my grandfather's 72 years old. He's sitting in his chair, first day of classes. He looks up and there's a young black kid, 18 years old, standing in the door. And he asked me, was there anything he could do to help me? And I said, yes, I'm looking for Dr. Naismith. I, I, I want to be a physical education major, and I've been told he's my advisor. He said, who told you that? My dad had just brought me to the campus and said, well, you're a man now. You're going to college. Get out. <laughs> I said, aren't you going to take me to the registrar's office? No. And he said, come on in. Dad's always right. Kansas is right there on the frontier of racial problems. I said, we ought to have a integrated competition in the state of North Carolina. There's Duke right over there, across town. There's a university in North Carolina, 12 miles away. There's North Carolina State. I did get a reply from the coach at Duke saying that I could come to the game out there, but if I came, I'd have to sit on the end of a bench and wear a waiter's coat. Coach Max and I team dominated the NAIA, winning three consecutive national titles in the late 50s. In 1978, John McClendon followed his teacher into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Not only in terms of being the first black coach, he was the first one to really play fast break basketball. Ten years later, basketball was being played all over the country. And in 1936, I saw it played for the first time at the Olympic Games. As national champions, the V8s had won the right to represent Canada in Berlin. But there was a snag. When they won the Canadian Championships in Windsor, uh, there was a few problems as far as money was concerned because at that time the Canadian government uh, did not fund their Olympians. Jim Stewart's father, Jim Sr., was a member of the V8s. So the players on the team were going to have to find the financial means to uh, get to Germany. Mr. Fuller, again, the, uh, went to Ford's to see if he would fund this trip, which he did. Between 1880 and World War I, approximately two million Jews come from the Tsarist Empire to the United States. So I grew up in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, and basketball was the sport. We didn't have a ball. We'd get a stocking hat and fill it with paper and tie it up with a rubber band. And throw it through the lower rung on the apartment house fire escape. To this day, some of the old timers like Hubie Brown calls the game that came out of the Jewish settlement houses 
Jubal. Ozzie Sheckman, everybody knows him. He scored the first basket for the NBA. Watching a great basketball player is like watching a great jazz artist. So I just take it back like this. Players of the Harlem Globetrotters were similar to a lot of black men in that generation. The style that the Globetrotters had became kind of like a style that started to pervade into the NBA game. By the mid-1940s, two stars emerged. Marcus Haynes with his dizzying dribbling and Reese Goose Tatum, the consummate showman. I was impressed with Marcus Haynes. I mean, he could do almost everything with the basketball. He was a rabbit, you know, he was a, a six-foot rabbit that could uh, handle the ball with his uh, you know, incredible speed. The things that I did were the dribbling, the ball, and the different types of shots, you know. That was a part that I played. Now the marvelous dribbling of Marcus Haynes. They can't get the ball. Well, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and my grandparents would take me to see him. And we had very few opportunities to see African American, you know, athletes. When the Globetrotters came through, that was always a big deal because they were really good basketball players, but being pure entertainers at the same time. They would play anywhere, anyhow, anytime. We played in bull rings. Whenever the Globetrotters came into town, it was just a wonderful, uh, fun-filled uh, afternoon, but it had, I think, some deeper meaning to it. He was telling us, we have no rooms available. And he said, well, out there on your sign, it says, uh, you know, you got, you got rooms. Yeah, I got vacancies. He said, well, you look out there on the sign now. And the guy had switched on no vacancy on the signs. And sometimes it was necessary for us to travel all night long before we would, in fact, get to a place that we could uh, we could stay. The players of the Harlem Globetrotters were similar to a lot of black men in that generation. Uh, people with enormous talent who couldn't always show their talent and had to suffer great indignity just to keep food on the table. And the strength and determination of that generation just to survive laid the groundwork for people like myself. Enter Abe Saperstein, a white Jewish immigrant from Chicago's north side. With an entrepreneurial spirit and a love of sports, Saperstein saw a business opportunity. They wanted to play in Wisconsin, they wanted to play in Michigan, and so a white guy would have a much easier time booking those games. The Globetrotters developed a style of play that simply became known as the show. In 1951, Berlin was still totally destroyed. Rebuilding hadn't started, so there were ruins all over the place. The U.S. State Department asked Abe Saperstein to bring his ambassadors of goodwill to Berlin Stadium along with the Globetrotters special guest, Jesse Owens. This helicopter comes in to land, and it was announced to the crowd that this is Jesse Owens arriving, and the crowd just went wild. He said to Jesse, in 1936, Hitler refused to give you his hand. And he said, today, Mr. Owens, I give you both of mine. When somebody like the Globetrotters showed up in Germany, and especially in Berlin, this was a tremendous symbolic event, and it also provided relief. That kind of ambassadorship helped the image of the United States of America. And the whole thing started with a couple of peach baskets I put up in a little gym 48 years ago. I guess it just goes to show what you can do if you have to. Indeed it does. So, Cozart, director of Fast Break, see you.